Thank you, Bruce, for the kind words of uh, introduction. It's so, um, it's so fun to get to welcome so many friends and colleagues to Bozeman for the 42nd Annual Montana History Conference. I'd like to thank the Montana Historical Society for bringing the conference to my hometown, thus giving me a chance to tell some great stories about historic places and cultural landscapes near and dear to my heart. Scheduling the event alongside homecoming for Montana State University provided an irresistible opportunity to paint for you the reciprocal relationship between MSU and the development of Bozeman. This morning I'll outline the ways in which MSU has affected Bozeman's physical and architectural development, econ economy, and community attitude. Of course, we can't talk about Bo uh, MSU without talking about the state capital campaign of 1892. Bozeman received the State Agricultural College as a runner-up prize in this 1892 campaign for the permanent state capital location. Despite the loss of the state capital, Bozeman's boosters were not about to lose out on the gravy train that is a state institution in town. We didn't get the state capital. We didn't get the state penitentiary, which we also wanted. We didn't get the state insane asylum, which we also wanted. So. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, we got the State Agricultural College, and I have to say, I think you'll agree with me, this is not bad for fourth place. Um, Kirby and I really wanted to make that the, the title of this talk, but we felt like maybe it was a little bit too punchy. <laughs> we tried valiantly, though. Uh, financial resources for the college uh, stemmed from the Morrill Act of 1862. It's one of the many Civil War, uh, Civil War era pieces of legislation that utilized our nation's greatest natural resource, the land mass, to provide a state college for agricultural and mechanical development and education in each state. In a manner akin to the Homesteading Act and Pacific Railroad Act, the Morrill Act conveyed 30,000 acres of federal land per senator and representative to support the college. Federal cash subsidies for the college included $15,000 the first year to fund construction of buildings on the campus to be increased $5,000 per year until the stipend reached $25,000. The Hatch Act of 1887 provided an additional $15,000 for the establishment of an agricultural experiment station to work in tandem with the college. Finding the right combination of land at the right price before the end of June 1893 was vital to securing the federal endowment. Community members let, met in Bozeman March 14th, 1893, and recommended that 80 acres of the Gallatin County Poor Farm and property from the adjacent Capitol Hill addition be secured and tenured, tendered to the state of Montana. The Capitol Hill addition is one of the many additions to the city of Bozeman platted as part of the state capital campaign. Between 1890 and 1892, the city added over 300 blocks <laughs> over a four mile stretch, and I'm giggling because the city at that time went from Rouse to Grand Avenues. Um, we certainly, it took a while to actually fill those lots and blocks in. Platted as the intended site of the state capitol, the Capitol Hill addition was part of the Northwest Guarantee Loan Bankruptcy. The property's owner, Louis Minaj, fled to Canada and then to Honduras when his company went broke in the Panic of 1893. <coughs> The college's executive board visited the various college sites around Bozeman and declared the location is a most desirable one. The site for the buildings is just half a mile southwest from the courthouse on the line of the electric streetcars. An abundance of water for irrigation and for all other purposes is furnished free to the state. Funding for the purchase of the 40 acres, or about 20 blocks, in the Capitol Hill edition materialized slowly until Nelson Story made a $1,500 donation that enabled the state to purchase the land at $10 an acre. In conveying the land, however, Story held on to a 1.7 acre parcel on the southwest corner of the campus. This spring site, now known as the MSU Duck Pond, was the water source for Story's 1886 West Main Street mansion. Built in the years before municipal water delivery, Story spent $50,000 having 37,000 pounds of iron pipe laid in order to move water downhill from the duck pond to his house. 
The change in elevation was so great that newspapers reported the spring was able to shoot water to the third floor of his house via gravity. <laughs> the duck pond came into MSU ownership in 1914 and underwent a major rehabilitation in 2008. I tell the story, I tell the tale of the story Waterworks because it underscores a theme of this presentation, the role of topography on the development of Bozeman and the Montana State University campus, which now constitutes a little over 30, 93 acres on the southwest flank of Bozeman. The core of the campus sits on a ridge which divides Bozeman Creek to the east and Mandeville Creek to the west. As a result, Montana Hall, elevation 4,910 feet, sits on the natural high point on Bozeman's south side of town. North of Montana Hall, the hill drops nearly 100 feet to Main Street. Topography, of course, is a crucial component in public works. Street sections, water distribution systems, and sewer removal systems are planned in relationship to the natural lay of the land. I bet I'm the first speaker at a history conference to talk about sewer before nine. <laughs> <laughs> the Young College's association with the experiment station proved integral to early growth. The assorted log cabins and small outbuildings left over from the site's poor farm days were of such poor quality as to be deemed unsuitable for purposes as of an experiment station. The college tapped a portion of the $15,000 in Hatch Act funding to construct Taylor Hall in 1894. Designed in, this, in the Queen Anne style by C.S. Hare of the Helena firm Lincoln Hare, the experiment station also served as classroom space until the 1920s. The college broke ground on Old Main, now known as Montana Hall, in 1896. Designed by Helena architect J.C. Paulson in the collegiate Gothic style, Montana Hall became the physical and symbolic heart of the campus. Besides classrooms and activities, Montana Hall contained the campus library and pr provided the backdrop to many school activities. Shortly thereafter, the college broke ground on the chemistry building just to the west and slightly downhill of Montana Hall, a drill hall, a veterinary building, and a heating plant. Many of these buildings were financed by loans which used the land granted to the university as collateral. In 1907, the Montana legislature allocated $800,000 towards construction of an agricultural building now known as Linfield Hall. The building was also designed by Lincoln Hare. Now the funny thing about this picture <laughs> is what you don't see. You don't see in the photograph the hundreds of 25 foot wide by 140 foot deep residential lots platted beyond Linfield Hall. It took us until the 1970s to build on some of those lots. This is looking northwest into um, what's now Bozeman's Law and Justice Center area. In a reflection of the growing portion of women attending the college, the 1909 state legislature pro provided $50,000 for construction of a women's dormitory on the campus. The college retained locally raised architect Fred Wilson to design the building in the Mission Revival and Arts and Crafts style. Upon completion, the dormitory housed and fed between 90 and 100 women and served as the only dormitory on campus until the 1934 construction of the Atkinson Quadrangle, which as, a si as an aside also only housed women. So, you can see how these on-campus construction projects provided uh, well-paying jobs for skilled laborers following the economic recessions of the, following the um, panics of 1893 and 1907. And also, <laughs> with, the, with the building of only a women's dormitory, you start to see how male students are an economic resource for Bozeman. They have to live in the community. They have to pay rent to someone. And we start, we see this again and again, the use of students as a, an economic resource in town. Students came from across the state to attend the Agricultural College and Mechanical College. Enrollment fluctuated between an all-time low of 36 in 1897 and a high of 77 in 1900. Graduating students chose from four-year degree programs including botany, zoology, physics, mathematics, modern languages, history, and English, <laughs> alongside agriculture, household economy, and applied science. With the shortage of on-campus living facilities, 
And students and staff sought refuge in privately owned homes, boarding houses, and rented rooms. The neighborhood around Cooper Park, to the north of the campus, became especially popular given its proximity to the university and the Main Street business district. Many of the Queen Anne and bungalow style residences lining the streets around Cooper Park were built by investors for renters and remain in the rental market today. In this regard, the students and the staff of the university and the money they spent on room and board buoyed Bozeman's oversubsidized real estate sector. The shortage of housing on the campus provided community members an opportunity to subsidize their mortgage by adding a student rental to the basement, a cultural tr tradition still very valuable to Bozemanites. The Cooper Park neighborhood was also adjacent to the electric trolley line, built in 1890 to connect the Northern Pacific Passenger Depot to the state capitol site. In reflection of the infrastructure following the users, the Bozeman Street Railway Company changed its route in the late summer of 1899. The Anaconda Standard reported, the change will be appreciated by the college students as it has been the custom of the company not to run the cars on days when the snow is badly drifted and the right of way is covered with ice when the weather is cold. Uh, from this construction, we have this fantastic photograph of the trolley lines running down South Grand Avenue. Uh, the city of Bozeman plans to rebuild South Grand Avenue in the next five years, and I'm trying to work with them to um, encourage some urban archaeology while they have that street opened up. Think of all the things that you might have lost off of a trolley line. It could be really interesting. <coughs> it took a bit for other infrastructure to reach the campus. The city was able to run a water line to campus by 1905. Lyman Creek, located under the M on the Bridger Range, was the city's only water source at the time. Water was gravity fed under the East Gallatin River, then up to College Hill. The water traveled via gravity, a distance of four miles, and with only a 135 foot elevation change between Lyman Creek at 5,045 feet and Montana Hall at 4,910 feet, the water pressure on campus was very low. With the discussion of water, you see how the topography of College Hill has affected the city's ability to provide sanitary services at a reasonable cost. We could always buy a pressure pump, but that was a cost. By 1916, growth on the south side of town further diminished water pressure on campus. There were reports of second floor toilets unable to flush and bans on watering yards. Bozeman's voters feared that the state would curtail further new construction on the campus due to fire danger. In April of that year, the community passed a $300,000 public works bond in order to acquire new water rights to the south of town, uphill from the campus. In an I I ironic end note, a fire broke out on the chemistry building in October 1916. There was insufficient water pressure to dampen the flames, and the building was a total loss. As anticipated, students flocked to the Montana Agricultural College, or MAC, after World War I. Student enrollment doubled to 607. Fortunately, Montanans, still in the midst of a post-war economic boom, felt secure enough to fund $5 million in bonds for constructions on college campuses and commit to a 3.5 mil levy on property taxes towards higher education in 1920. In addition to its share of the bond, MSC accessed $60,000 in state funding for an agricultural or an engineering building and $50,000 in insurance mo money from the chemistry building. Shanley and Baker of Great Falls designed Lewis Hall for chemistry and Romney Jen, while Carlsley from Helena designed Traphagen. Fred Wilson designed the remaining package of buildings, including Herrick Hall, Roberts Hall, the Ryan Labs, and the steam plant. Wilson seen here at the footings for um, Herrick Hall looking south, was born in a log house on Main Street in Bozeman and educated locally. He completed his architectural training from Columbia University and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, defined as an educated gentleman by my friend Bill Grabo. Wilson's prolific career produced over a thousand buildings of all architectural styles between 1910 and his death in the late 1950s. He designed a number of buildings on the MSU campus and we're so lucky to have his entire architectural drawing set um, archive on file at Montana State University Special Collections. Um, you can ask him, I bother, I come in there probably twice a month and just flip through these beautiful drawing sets. 
The site for Roberts Hall, um, which Wilson designed, had such high groundwater that the first contractor is rumored to have gone broke trying to dewater the building's foundation. Indeed, the modern engineering campus at MSU actually floats like a boat in a bathtub on all of the high groundwater. Construction of Roberts Hall also brought Wilson into contact with the nascent School of Architectural Engineering at MSC. Developed as part of a curriculum to make MSC the MIT of the West, and to save the state money by preventing duplication of degrees between the Bozeman and Missoula campuses, the architectural engineering program joined chemical and irrigation engineering um, in Roberts Hall. Architectural engineering occupied the third floor and included the Architects Club, founded at MSC in 1919. The program was led by W.F. Plew, who, who arrived to the Bozeman campus in 1913 as an assistant professor of civil engineering. A notorious perfectionist, Plew served as the, campaign's super, or the campus's supervising architect. He received a master's in architectural engineering from the University of Illinois in 1920 before returning to Bozeman and his duties at MSC. Plew's architectural engineering skills impacted Bozeman and the state. He designed a number of buildings in Bozeman, including the Clark Apartments in 1914, the Martinsdale Apartments in 1926, and the Beale Park Recreation Center in 1927. Records on file at Montana State University in indicate that Plu partnered with Wilson to handle the architectural engineering for a variety of Wilson's projects, including the 1913 addition to Gallatin County High School and 1914 Blackmore Apartments. So in this regard, you see how MSU staff starts to have an impact on um, privately or semi-publicly owned buildings in Bozeman. For the university, Plu designed a number of agricultural structures, including a beef cattle barn, a horse barn, a, a, and a poultry building for the experiment station. It's an unclear if these structures, initially built on the Bozeman Agricultural Experiment Station, were rep replicated in experiment stations across the state. We really need a cultural resources survey of all of the experiment stations across the state to understand how far Plu's designs from the third floor of Roberts Hall went. Did they go to Ekalaka and to Weibo, or did they stay just in the north central Montana area? It's something that I would really like to see us collaborate on. Plu likely consulted on the structural engineering for Romney Gym. As a uniquely single purpose building, Romney and anchored the southern terminus of the campus. Immediately on, upon completion of the building, the community began to see an economic benefit from the structure when 16 high school basketball teams arrived in March 1927 to compete in the state basketball tournament. Over 100 players and coaches utilized donated beds and linens to sleep in the gym during the event. Hundreds of parents and fans sought accommodations in Bozeman's hotels and boarding houses. I know that the Class C basketball tournament is still a dearly beloved uh, event on campus. Romney Gym was also the site of a revolution in college basketball, as the 1928-29 Golden Bobcat team combined a revolutionary fast break offense with a high pressure defense. The team went on to finish with a 36-2 record and be named the national champions by the Helms Athletic Foundation. Three players were named All-Americans and one inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame. All of the structures were heated by steam via underground pipes and tunnels from the steam plant. As a fuel source, the steam plant depended on coal deliveries uh, from the Milwaukee Road, and, which was completed um, from the south into Bozeman in 1912. There's something really ironic about having coal deliveries over an electric railroad. <coughs> On campus, parking emerged as an issue by the mid-1930s as students, who s most of, of whom were still not living on campus, started bringing cars to campus in order to get from uh, their residence to the college campus. The college acted as an economic stabilizer for Bozeman's economy during the Depression. Bozeman's population grew as students sought to improve their job opportunities through higher education. New residences in the minimal traditional and colonial and Tudor revival styles began filling in the blocks around campus platted during the 1890 state capital campaign, which 50 years. I looked up, I had to do, do the math the long way, I got a history degree. Um, 
<laughs> but in that regard, we do this in Bozeman. We plot a whole bunch of stuff, and then it takes us years to fill it in. And then, oh my gosh, we, fill, we filled it in, and we seem to have forgotten how to plot new stuff. <clears throat> Despite being a staunch conservative and no fan of Roosevelt, MSC President Atkinson bowed to pressure from the growing student population and acquiesced to the use of Public Works Administration funding to construct a new dormitory complex in 1934. Designed by Wilson in the Jacobethan revival style, the facility, ironically named for Atkinson, provided residential space for female students on the MSC campus. Again, just the girls. Wilson used the same Jacobethan revival style for construction of the Strand Union Building in 1939. Funded through a $5 per quarter student fee, the Strand Union prov provided desperately needed indoor student gathering space on the MSC campus. This was the first time that student fees directly funded a facility. In building the facility, students passed their money onto Bozeman's construction industry, further supporting the local economy. While Hamilton Hall and the Atkinson Quadrangle provided living space for female students, there remained no available on-campus housing for men. To that end, a robust system of fraternities and sororities developed in the neighborhoods adjacent to campus. In this manner, students provided yet another economic relief valve in the community, giving owners of grand old homes on Wilson College and Cleveland Avenues um, some, an option for what to do with these huge houses. It was easier to, to make the heating payment if you had 20 people splitting the bill rather than one small family. Perhaps the most famous incident of this is the acquisition of the TB Story Mansion at 811 South Wilson Avenue by the Sigma Alpha Epsilon Fraternity in the fall of 1923. TB Story, in financial trouble at the end of World War I, sold the property to the SAEs for $30,000. The SAEs put 5,000 down on the property and financed the remainder through Story's Commercial National Bank at 6% interest per year. Payments were $175 a month. To those who call the Story Mansion that old frat house, I say to you, thank God for the SAEs. If not for the SAEs purchase and if not for those students paying for the building for so long, um, the, the Grand Homes historic setting would have likely been ruined by the development of six or eight residential home sites on the back half of the lot. Returning veterans, funded by the GI Bill, flocked to the MSC campus after World War II. Enrollment was up 100% by the fall of 1945 and was 150% of the 1944 figure by 1946. The explosion of the campus population of students and staff triggered a major building boom, uh, both on campus and in the adjacent neighborhoods. Between 1945 and 1950, the faculty grew from 132 to 257. While enrollment fell briefly from its all-time high of 3,165 in 1947, it never again reached pre-war levels, and by 1960, stood at almost 4,000. Two areas of development on the campus especially impacted and were impacted by the city of Bozeman's public works, specifically the construction of new dormitories and the construction of the field house. Completed in 1955, the Lewis and Clark Hall served as MSC's first permanent men's dormitory. 1955! It took them 65 years to build a place for the guys to live on campus. I, I, as I was putting this together, I just kind of became more and more incredulous. I cannot believe that they let that go that long. <laughs> Lang, uh, Langford Hall, a 408 stu uh, student men's dormitory constructed immediately to the west just five years later, shared dining facilities with Lewis and Clark Hall. Even though the two women's dormitories, Hamilton Hall and the Atkinson Quadrangle already existed, Many female students still lived in post, uh, substandard post-war Quonset huts during the early 1950s. Hannon Hall and Hafner Hall, both constructed in the women's cluster at the northeast corner of campus, relieved this situation by providing housing and dining services for 608 women. As MSU's enrollment grew and housing remained hard to come by, participation in the fraternities and sororities adjacent to MSU also grew. 
Clustered to the east of campus, the Greek organizations inhabited big old houses on Cleveland or built new modern fraternities, like the Alpha Gamma Delta sorority house designed by Hugo Eck in 1959, or the Pi Beta Phi sorority designed by Bill Grabo in 1965. Both Grabo and Eck are graduates of MSU's School of Architecture. With the successful sale of revenue bonds in 1953, Run could mo move forward with a new basketball facility, which Bozeman architects Oswald Bird, Berg and Fred F. Wilson brought to life in their 1956 design. Upon completion in 1958, the Fieldhouse represented Bozeman's first and possibly only architectural wonder. Its 90-foot tall, 300-foot round arena was at the time the largest wooden dome structure in the world. Someone uh, who probably should know, told me once if it were four feet wider, they could play football in it. I'm kind of glad they don't. Um, <laughs> it's it hot. <laughs> With a seating capacity listed at 8,400, the field house provided indoor space for a wide variety of events, including the 1960 World Middleweight Boxing Ch Championship, the National College Finals Rodeo, high school basketball and volleyball tournaments, track meets, and countless other concerts, shows, and events. So in this regard, we again see facilities on the MSU campus as an economic engine for Bozeman. Construction of the field house had a long-lasting impact on Bozeman's street system. Inciting the building, the university petitioned the city of Bozeman to abandon the Lincoln Street right-of-way, which is right here, located to the north of the field house. Abandoning the Lincoln Street right-of-way pushed future traffic south of the university to what is now Keggy Boulevard. To that end, Bozeman's modern east-west connectivity is hampered by a long stretch, let's go back here, um, by a long stretch of the university, and especially exacerbated when Keggy is closed for a football game. Um, <laughs> I have a three-year-old daughter, and my husband, I'm sorry, Dusty, I didn't know you were gonna be here when I planned to tell this story. Um, <laughs> has a, a genetic inability to hit a green light. <laughs> and so, we live on the west side of Bozeman. Oh, she was born in November, so we had this whole game plan of, okay, if there's a football game, you cannot take Main Street, because there were 17 stoplights between our house and the hospital. Um, we ended up going in earlier in the morning. <clears throat> Closing the, north, the loop north of Montana Hall, including the Cleveland and Harrison rights of way, the South 7th right of way, and Garfield Street, also impacted connectivity through the campus. Campus is really now something that must be driven around rather than through. Mid-century growth especially impacted Bozeman's sewer system. You can forgive me for not having a great slide for this. Um, we don't take pictures of guys putting pipe in the ground, unfortunately. Um, New construction on campus had the potential to overburden undersized lines. The construction of Lewis and Clark Dormitory in 1955 brought the issue to the forefront for the first time. Though the six-inch sewer main on College and 8th Avenue was more convenient to connect to, the city required MSC to construct a larger connection to the eight-inch main on College and 9th, which could handle a larger capacity. The city anticipated further issues of this nature and called for the necessity of having an all-over plan uh, for buildings to be constructed in the future of the campus and possible sewer loads for these buildings. The planned construction of the Hedges and Roski dormitories brought the issue of sewer uh, pipe capacity to the head again in 1963. Located west of the ridge separating Mandeville Creek and Bozeman Creek, so again, here's Montana Hall, which sits on that ridge, Here's, this is uh, Main Street and Huffine, this is Wilson, this is South 11th Avenue, and this circle is the field house. <coughs> the options included pumping sewage uphill to a main on 9th, or running a new main 1.5 miles downhill to the north to a point of lower elevation. MSC resolved the issue by partnering with the city of Bozeman to construct what they called the Far West Trunk Main, which opened large portions of the West Side Addition, all of that stuff that was behind Linfield Hall for residential development after 1963. The university has had an immeasurable impact on Bozeman's economy. The Morrill Act 
um, of 18, nine, or excuse me, the Morrill Act guaranteed federal appropriations to support the campus up to $25,000 per year after 1896, a value of nearly $715,000 using today's inflation. Bozeman's contractors were the beneficiary of the largesse of the 1919 and 1945 Montana legislatures who used state budgets flush with post-war cash to fund major new buildings on campus. Student fees adopted by a vote of the student body were also used to construct the student union building, fund a health and fitness center, expand the Wren Library, and, to, and in a deal to construct the Reno H. Sales, now Bobcat Football Stadium. With the help of the Alumni Association to construct Reed and Gaines Hall in the 1960s, President Wren was in, introduced the idea of private fundraising to construct new buildings on campus. That tradition continues with the Jabs College of Business, a $25 million donation, and the Abramson Engineering Building, a $50 million donation. I would like to offer the following suggestion. Students are Bozeman's most renewable economic resource. By failing to construct a dormitory until 1955, we made MSU's male students an economic resource for Bozeman. They rented private property in town, thus indirectly paid into the community's tax base. Their need for housing incentivized construction of investment properties, which remain student rentals. 15,294 students are currently enrolled at Montana State University. Over two-thirds of these students work while they attend classes. Students will work part-time, which means employers don't have to bear the financial burden of providing health or retirement benefits. Students will work in uh, seasonal jobs, and they come back every year. In fact, more of them come back every year, <laughs> making it easy to fill open positions. MS MSU's faculty and staff, currently over 3,000 people, um, also support Bozeman's economy. They need places to live, they bring their families, and over one-third of Bozeman's households have someone affiliated with, with the university living in the, the home. Students stay and start technology companies and other companies. And of course, the university supports Bozeman's economy by providing free or low-cost cultural events like band concerts, Shakespeare in the Park, organizational meetings. This is the 1932 Stock Growers Association meeting at Linfield Hall and events like the powwow, which invite the state to participate in Native American culture. <laughs> of course, you can't have a presentation about history in MSU from someone with the last name of Kramer without a reference to MSU's football program, um, which does draw tens of thousands of attendees and fans to Bozeman each fall. The presence of a university has also impacted the community's progressive attitude especially in the uh, regard of equality of opportunity. From the beginning, the Montana Agricultural College offered degrees to students of both sexes, provided they were 14 years of age and possessed a sufficient common school education to enable them to pursue, pursue creditably the work undertaken. The student minority population tends to follow Montana's demographics. The first American an um, African-American student graduated in 1960, and the university currently has a robust American Indian um, Native American studies program. Faculty and staff demand high quality public education for their children, and to that end, the community has a track record of overwhelming support for school bonds, sometimes to the detriment of historic preservation. I sometimes joke that the school district has never seen an old building they didn't want to tear down. <laughs> including this gorgeous Longfellow School on South Tracy Avenue, replaced in 1937 at the ripe old age of 42 years with Public Works Administration funding. The new building was designed by Wilson with architectural engineering by Plew right at the end of his career. Bozeman has a strong community culture of advocacy and giving back. As of the 2014 tax reporting cycle, there were 413 nonprofits headquartered in Bozeman. <clears throat> the same study found that Bozeman's nonprofits have a $1.1 billion annual gross economic output in the local economy. This included $179 million in total labor income and 5,142 full or part time jobs. The nonprofit se sector generated $23 million in indirect business taxes and fees. During Give Big Gallatin Valley, the community raised over $237,000 in 24 hours for 100 local nonprofits. 
In conclusion, I offer that the presence of Montana State University has played a vital role in shaping Bozeman's physical layout, architectural language, economy, and cult community culture. As a graduate of MSU and a 15-year resident of Bozeman, I cannot imagine one without the other. Thank you.